Sí. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Dinidhi, and today I'll be presenting to you my research, a deep learning approach to uh, predict health status using microbiome profiling. So first, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to this domain so that you can understand my research better. So starting off with what microbes and what the microbiome is. So a microbe is a tiny living organism like bacteria, virus, fungus, or protozoa. And the microbiome consists of the collection of uh, a community of such microbes. So uh, moving on to the human microbiome. So the human microbiome is all the microbes that reside on or within human tissues. And they live in various body sites like skin, lung, saliva, and the gastrointestinal tract. And it is said that uh, this microbiome weighs about one to 1 1.5 kilograms of our entire weight. So, sorry. And the microbiome is very important uh, in our life and it plays an important role in digestion, benefiting our immune system, controlling brain activity, metabolizing therapeutics and biosynthesis of vitamins. And uh, so in my research, I have focused on the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is the uh, microorganisms that live in the gastrointestinal tract. And about a majority of the bacteria of the human body are living in this GI tract. And that's about 99% of your entire microbiome. And uh, there's about 500 to 1,000 species of bacteria that reside in the gut. So um, researchers have found that the gut microbiome is linked to uh, several diseases like colorectal cancer, liver cirrhosis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and uh, type 2 diabetes. And they have found that the gut microbiomes of diseased individuals tend to have different bacterial species than the healthy individuals. And uh, a common alteration in these uh, differences is the loss of microbial richness, or we call this a dysbiosis. So, um, and with the advent of genetic tools and improvements in sequencing technology, now we can uh, very easily characterize the composition and the function of microbiomes. And uh, researchers have attempted to find uh, the properties of the human gut, uh, gut microbiome that can identify health or disease. And these studies will give us a very valuable understanding into ways the microbiome could be altered to uh, improve our human health. So if we take a look at the machine learning approaches that uh, explore the impact of the gut microbiome on human health, they fall under two main categories. One are tends for disease likelihood prediction and the other one is health status prediction. So if we uh, take a look at the terms for disease likelihood prediction, what you're doing here is you're trying to uh, predict whether a person has a particular disease or not. Uh, diseases like type diabetes, colorectal cancer, and liver cirrhosis. In health status prediction, uh, we try to predict whether a person is healthy or not. So we pull uh, microbes or microbial profiles of diseased individuals into one healthy, non health category, and we try to see whether that person is healthy or not. And uh, so MetaML and GMHI are two attempts. Uh, that have tried this health status prediction. And in Metamil, they have identified microbial species that can sign uh, a general dysbiosis. And uh, they say that uh, some these microbial species can uh, signal a general uh, dysbiosis instead of like, being uh, linked to a particular disease. And uh, also, they have identified that the dysbiotic microbiome is uh, unique from the health microbiome regardless of what the disease is. So um, if you take a look at these approaches, this is a fluid prediction and health status prediction, we can see there's a lack of studies that are exploring uh, the direction of the health status prediction. But as I mentioned in the previous studies, uh, there are studies that show that the dysbiotic microbiomes are unique from the healthy microbiomes. So we are trying to use a deep learning approach to utilize the data collected from a range of diseases to predict whether a person is healthy or not. 
and also identify which taxonomic level of microbes are most informative for health status prediction. So uh, moving on to the research design. So this is the general pipeline. It's select, uh, data collection, data preprocessing, then health state prediction using the deep learning model and then evaluation. So in the data collection phase, we used uh, 339 raw shotgun stool samples collected from eight independently published studies. And we used 155 healthy and 184 non-healthy subjects. So we defined healthy subjects as uh, subjects that did not have a disease or any adverse symptoms by the time of the original studies. And non-healthy subjects uh, were clinically diagnosed with a particular disease, or they either had an abnormal weight based on their BMI. So these are the data sets that we use and the diseases we considered, colorectal adenoma, colorectal cancer, overweight, obesity, or underweight. And we pulled all these diseases into one non-healthy category, and then also used 155 healthy uh, samples. So uh, this is the data pre-processing pipeline. So this is a usual pipeline uh, followed in microbial studies, starting with removing low quality bases, discarding reads shorter than 60 base pairs in length, and then uh, taxonomic profiling into species and general level uh, profiles, then finally removing viruses and unclassified species or genera. So let me zoom in onto this third step because we will need it in the future. So. Every organism has a taxonomic assignment. So as you can see in these four organisms, they all have a, a species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and kingdom. So all these uh, organisms belong to the Animalia kingdom. And as you go up this taxonomy tree, you can see that uh, the information gets more uh, specific or more informative. So in microbes also have a taxonomic assignment like this. In this study, we have looked at what species exist in each of these samples and what, what genus or genera exist in each of these samples. Then uh, after that, we uh, calculated the relative abundances and found out that there's 569 species and 184 genera in the data sets that we use. And then we created a reusable workflow using Galaxy to, create, uh, to carry out the steps. Then uh, the deep learning model for health uh, prediction. These are the uh, activation function we use for the hidden layer versus ReLU uh, for the output layer sigmoid. Number of units in the hidden layers was set to half of that of the preceding layer and loss function was binary cross entropy. And uh, we uh, varied the following hyperparameters, number of hidden layers, epochs, number of units in the first layer and the dropout rate. And moving on to the evaluation and results. So uh, the evaluation part, we first split the data into 80 to 20% ratio into training and test data. Then on the training data, we performed 10-fold cross-validation and found out the best hyperparameters and then uh, trained the data again using those hyperparam best hyperparameters and finally tested on the test data. So the first experiment carried out was to see uh, which taxonomic level would be more uh, useful in this uh, health status prediction. So, um, so we identified 569 species as the features and uh, the following metrics were found 0.957 UC, 0.897 accuracy, and the following high parameters, 0.1 drop rate, two hidden layers, and uh, the first layer had 100 nodes. So if we compare this uh, performance for the general level species uh, profiles, there were 184 general levels, so that is lower than the number of features used in the species. And also the performance is uh, lower than that was recorded in uh, species level, 0.889 AUC, 0.897 accuracy, and the hyperparameter settings was a drop rate of 0.1, two hidden layers in the first two hidden layers are the first hidden layer of the DNA and had 300 nodes. And uh, then the next thing we did was to address the sparseness of the data sets. So microbial data sets are very uh, sparse. So some samples or some species are only existent in very few number of uh, samples. So you can see in these uh, diagrams, the white areas are where there are no uh, 
the species are not available in those samples. So what we did was we discarded the features that are rarely present and uh, used a threshold. And if the species or the genera contains null values for more than 95% of the samples, they were discarded and we perform, uh, formed a new data set. So uh, from the 500 uh, plus features, now we only have 162 spe species as the features. And also we can see uh, the AUC, uh, the performance metrics have improved 0 0.898 uh, AUC, 0 0.941 uh, accuracy. And moving on to general level species, uh, it's also down to 99 genera. And also compared to the previous performance in the general level species, now we have an improvement, 0.932 AUC, 0.912 accuracy. And the high parameter settings were dropout rate of 0.2, three hidden layers, and the first hidden layer had 500 nodes. Then we can perform the comparison with MetaML. MetaML is a model that is uh, often compared with uh, in these microbial uh, disease likelihood related predictions. So they have introduced uh, these two models using random forest classifier and support vector machine. And we use the same data sets uh, after removing, after seeing the sparseness. And uh, here also we can see that uh, the species level uh, profiles have better performances than for the general level uh, profile, sorry. And out of all three models, the DNN is what uh, has the better performance. So this is just a comparison of all the models. Uh, DNN with original data set and the DNN after we address this uh, sorry, uh, low abundance species or uh, genera, then the uh, random forest and the SVM in the MetaML, we can see that the DNN uh, with the data set with after removing the low abundance species of genera is what uh, gave us the best performance. So moving on to the conclusions, we found out that species level profiles uh, were what outperform the general level profiles in terms of AUC. And after we address the low abundance, the, in, sorry, uh, the classification performance improved further. And uh, even when we compared with the MetaML, uh, there also we can see the species level profiles give better performances than the general level profiles. So we conclude that uh, fine grain species level features are more suited for the task of health status prediction than uh, higher level general level species features. So moving on to the future work. So uh, we can increase the diversity of the samples by including microbiome profiles of individuals coming from a range of countries across continents where the lifestyles and diet patterns are uh, drastically different. This is actually a limitation of the study also, because we have to uh, make sure that our study can be applied to anyone in this world. So that is something we can address. And uh, the other thing we can do is introduce samples that come uh, with different gut related diseases, other than the ones we have included here, like ulcerative colitis, liver cirrhosis, or any other gut related diseases. And another extension can be. Uh, to extend this study for microbiomes of other body sites like skin or oral or lung microbiome because the species in these microbiomes are greatly different. So we can find uh, other, maybe we can, it can lead to a different result. So that is also another extension we can do. So that brings my presentation to an end. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Diniti. So the session is now it's open for the questions and answers and anything yet yeah yeah hi uh interesting uh, uh in terms of microbes uh, when you start the research the assumption is that you already know based on those species uh which diseases are there so uh, it's in your introduction it says uh, uh tend to be different uh from that of the healthy individuals which prompts the idea that gut micro uh, microbe uh, being a decisive factor in human health. Mm -hmm. You already, have you done a kind of a clustering initially just to check with, whether it clusters based on those diseases? No, that Before is based training? on previous yeah. literature I took that, okay. yeah. So when you are doing a, uh, what's your input 
a vector like how do you uh, it's a species is it your yeah species uh, and general labels and target labels were, uh, the target labels were the popular diseases uh, in your training set sorry uh, when you when you train it what's your yeah. target labels uh, as in is sorry what what's a target uh, uh, that means this particular pattern gives this particular it's a cirrhosis or whatever it's uh no i predict whether that person is healthy or not uh, just uh, it's a binary yeah. binary prediction okay so what is the input uh, of the what is input is that uh, how many uh, it's actually percentage of uh, for each sample we are finding out what species are there or what genus genera are there and we are giving a percentage of how much is existing what is the rate size Size of, Size of the data set was 339 samples. Do you think with the size of data set you can get the good result with the deep learning technique? I wanted to use more, but uh, I had a resource limitation because one sample data set is about like 2, 2 GB to 4 GB in size. So this data set only is about uh, 600 GB. I wanted to extend it more. There was this study that uh, GMHI study had a lot of data. So if they had uh, the profile, you know, after the microbial profiling, if they made that data set available, then that, that would be really good. But uh, with the resources I had, this is the data set I got. Yeah, uh, I have one other question. Uh, what is the related research done on, on this uh, same subject and what is your contribution? In addition to what is being reported, sorry, yeah. Are there any reported research literature on this? Uh, not in uh, so this health state prediction wise, there were two that I showed the GMHI that is a statistical mathematical index. So using that mathematical index, you are predicting when they are healthy or not. And the other one is this MetaML. So that is also using RFC uh, and SVM. So this is the one that uses deep learning for the first time. So you 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 are trying to claim that there are no such research anywhere reported so far. Uh, for my knowledge, as for my knowledge. And, yeah. <laughs> what are the limitations of your research? Uh, limitations were the limitations? ones that I discussed previously. You know, uh, because uh, we have to extend. We have to know that we can. Uh, apply this universally. So mainly uh, a problem in these microbial data sets is that most of these data sets come from, uh, you know, a European descent. So we might not be, a, that might not be applicable to someone in Asia. Uh, our diets are different and the microbial profiles are different. And we barely have any data sets from Antarctica. So yeah, that's one thing. You consider actually this uh, problem is uh, uh, gender independent and age level independent gender yeah yeah so for so, this i didn't think of uh, i didn't it's out of scope all right so so which means you can't generalize this for all the population yeah yeah that is something that is you know for future so so you are claiming that yours is the first Deep learning. No, no. <laughs> approach or? No, no. Uh, this is, uh, how do I say it? Not the first. Yeah, according to your knowledge, you can, you are claiming that this is. No, the, no. no. So, 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 okay. So, let's say there's a gadget. You get a, uh, let's say, a sample of stool and it just gives the, uh, let's say, full spectrum of microbes and uh, it can give a kind of prediction. Let's say you're healthy or not. No, it can actually be like, a, uh, are you healthy or not in a box? So, so, so is that what you are predicting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what is the performance like? So, so what is the... Um, Accuracy or how can you claim with that limited data set? You said the data set is very limited. It's like 300 plus. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also think that it is not a sufficient 
data set. So, yeah. So, so how would you find the accuracy or um, what is your conclusion actually at the end uh, with this uh, deep learning approach with this limited data set? Yeah. So, it is what I want to say is that because it hasn't been like mainly you're trying the work that have been done is like predicting whether you have a disease or not. So what I wanted to go in the direction was uh, to say that we can all uh, pick these non-healthy uh, samples into one category and the one healthy ones into another category and that uh, they are actually classifiable because people think that because you know like I'm fitting uh, diseases you know having very different like you don't think liver cirrhosis and obesity you can put them in the same category right so people say that uh, they have different signals or whatever so what i'm trying to say is uh, that they are actually classifiable and i'm trying to uh, bring that the claim about uh, you know that metaml and gmhi index they have shown that microbial signatures are able to show whether a person is healthy or not. So I wanted to do uh, the same with the deep learning approach. So it has been done before that classification, you wanted to prove that that can also be done through deep learning. Yeah, and also the other part was what taxonomic level of uh, features can be better for the performance prediction. So, so, so how would you compare the accuracy with respect to the your mechanism with the other mechanisms? The GMHI one, I, I, that is not comparable because uh, the technology was not made available open source. So um, I couldn't compare with that. I did the comparison with Metaemia. So you think that your one can outperform the other approaches or? I need more data, so yeah. Yeah, that is an interesting research because it looks like that in future, today morning, once we go to the toilet, we can see whether we are healthy or not. Right. Thank you, uh, Diniti, and uh, thank you for the audience for bringing up uh, some of the most uh, interesting and valuable questions. So without taking much time, I would like to invite the second uh, paper or the second speaker, uh, Varuna Lasanta, and he's an uh, analyst project management professional, and he's joining with us online. So his paper is about generating REST API using meta design paradigm for rapid development of microservice architecture based applications. Good day to you all. Uh, I'm Varuna Lasanta. Uh, my research topic is generating REST APIs using meta design paradigm for rapid development of microservice architecture based applications. So, here uh, uh, we know the development of business and social company applications is a challenging task due to the changing of the requirements today. So, open requirements evolve through the business process. So, systems need to meet the uh, needs of multiple user groups uh, with the conflicting requirements sometimes. So, best option is to get the involved end users in the development process and make the uh, developers also uh, uh, rapid uh, tools to do the job quickly. So, the meta design paradigm is one of the best approach for this. So, uh, here uh, I'm developing a meta model to overcome the time, uh, especially time taken to do the repetitive task. That's a development. Also deploy and uh, deliver the product less time with more accuracy uh, and to collaborate by the group of people and uh, create tools and interfaces for users to be involved in the development process. So uh, in the problem definition, uh, you know, there are many projects fail uh, due to the 
for documentation, validation, and also the uh, it's not satisfied the customer requirements at the end. Uh, in that case, it is a you know it is an expensive task in both customer end and the software company end. So uh, mostly the applications were due to customer requirement failing. Uh, that is the main concern. So uh, get the participation of the end users at the development stage. Uh, we can get the requirements more clearly because uh, they are the experts in the uh, domain of that particular business domain. So the best option is to provide them a component-based solution which they can uh, participate in the development process. Also, uh, developers uh, can be uh, involved and they can do the repetitive task very quickly uh, when they are doing the development. So uh, meta design paradigm will play a significant role in this case. So uh, my objectives are there's already uh, CBIS 3.0 is developed that is component based e-business application development and requirement shell. So it is uh, developer knowledge embedded into that shell and the software systems building from that is basically monolithic architecture. So here uh, is aimed to improve the uh, CBIS to the next level that is to support the API, this microservices and also to the uh, 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 fit to the next uh, technological era which supports the containerized architecture. So uh, here uh, I'm developing a new uh, designing a new model for the uh, new meta model for to support the new CBIS that is CBIS 4.0 and also uh, building a, a prototype uh, using that CBIS application. So. Uh, when this CBIT is improved to the uh, with the REST API based containerized architecture, it will be able to handle the new trends of the development process that means the current development. Also, that uh, meta design process will be fit to the new technology stuff that is the uh, with these all APIs and the uh, containerized architecture, also with the deployment process. Uh, so the background, uh, when you think about the background, there are already works going on since uh, 2007. This uh, CBIS was developed and it was uh, going to some uh, improvements. And now in, in my research, I'm going to improve it to the next level, that is from monolithic to the REST API based architecture. And also in 2003, uh, there's a development that is a wizard based uh, development process. And also, uh, 2017, uh, another development, it is a three layer meta design model. And also, in 2019, it's another methodology for developing information systems based on single consistent representation. So, in my literature, in this uh, Akunda Ginge, uh, 2007, developed this uh, component based application development shell, which has application permission objects. And on uh, that is basically I'm uh, focusing my research to the next level, and also there are works there are works going on through this. That is in 2016, develop this Visan based CDU development process. Uh, also uh, in 2007, as another development, there is a three layer uh, model uh, which uh, focuses on customizing this certain area of interest. So that is an, another meta design model with the three layers. Uh, also, there's another development by uh, Rogo uh, that is they pro proposes to design structures for meaning of knowledge to create forms at this stage of form initialization. Uh, so there is another literature which has gone into the, this area of the development. So uh, also there are framework enabled development which uh, focus on this area, which uh, works on different uh, in the frameworks, they try to uh, achieve the goal. So, uh, when I come to the methodology, so uh, the uh, research is based on improving the meta design paradigm is in software development. So, the new system and database model will be designed and developed. The existing architecture will be fine tuned to suit the REST API with the containerized model. And finally, new design architecture, also, new prototype will be developed. Uh, so I have uh, done uh, analysis in existing systems by going through 
different domains with their uh, requirement documentation. So this is from the sales domain, this is from inventory uh, side, uh, and this is from the, the drug application. It's a mobile app. It is a medical domain. And uh, this is another uh, backend for web content management. And this is some agricultural domain. So these are some applications which I have taken into analyze and then uh, which I have done a code in from existing systems where which uh, taken coded those systems feature wise and identified the common features using the power folder. Also uh, coding by, done by form element wise. Also SQL data type wise and form, uh, found the commons uh, from these uh, existing systems which I have analyzed already. And from that I found that uh, the usage of the the form elements and the data types. This uh, chart is showing that uh, the number of uh, usages of different uh, data types and also the form elements. And also, uh, in next chart, it shows here uh, how these uh, modules in each system is uh, commonly used uh, in. The systems which I have analyzed, like each system contains authentication module, register module. So these are some common modules which is used in every system. So when I'm considering development, is CBS to the next level. I have considered these things uh, for, because these are commonly used in each and every uh, system. So I have developed this new uh, uh, model. So that is which we have uh, application controller, use case controller. And also, which contain route middleware, and when the API request comes, so it uh, uh, there's an artisan command executor which generate that artisan commands, and from that it creates uh, to all this application folder, and then also the database, and also <clears throat> it once a particular artisan command executes, it creates the route request control and model everything. Uh, and uh, it is completely uh, create the database table for that particular request and also it is possible to uh, export the postman collection of the api so which contains three layers that is the uh, which is the cbits layer which is then the application api layer and the database layer so this is a new model which i have developed uh, for creating this uh, cbits to enhance the cbits to the next level so from that, uh, we could create uh, the uh, using new version, we could create uh, applications, uh, then use cases or the functions with the endpoints, functions of those applications. Then we, we could export the Postman collection from the system and uh, it is automatically creating the uh, tables and the database and tables and the particular, uh, the required folder structure for the project. So, uh, basically, when we take the uh, CB, it's it's uh, we can consider it's like we know it's metal cutting saw. Then when we take that metal cutting saw, we know uh, it is a basic version. Uh, so of the saw. So, but when we uh, added new knowledge, so we can uh, we know we have heavy duty metal cutting top saw. So which is more faster, and uh, you can do some uh, high. Uh, Works. Also, uh, the, the next improvement of it is uh, the lathe machine, which is the more improvement. We know in this each step of the improvement, there are new knowledge is integrated to this uh, process. So same thing we have done in CBITS. So uh, when we come to the framework-based development, we have integrated uh, new knowledge. Uh, actually, here we have we are integrating the developer knowledge. So the, once a developer knowledge we are integrate, we integrate the things which the developer is effectively doing. And we develop the first version of the CBITS. And now uh, in my project, I'm doing the improvement to the next version. Next, I, I have done new developer knowledge improvement and we have with the new CBITS version. So here we can do more tasks, more easily, more repetitive tasks we can do quickly. So, uh, this is the CBITS application uh, interface which we have developed. Uh, so here, when we come to the uh, comparison of the CBITS, when we uh, when we know if you uh, it's a uh, common use uh, framework that is Laravel, if we 
to go into do a particular task uh, even you are yeah, the console which is providing you have to remember and type these all commands and to do the task task but here in see it's uh, you have the uh, gui just you have to just click a uh, few steps and you can do the task right so then also uh, the laravel uh, when you consider it create uh, files without the uh, validations basic validation but here we create it uh, validation according to the given given fields uh, and also uh, here in cbits uh, we have to just select the data types and very easily you can uh, create the fields but in uh, laravel you have to do it manually by specifying also uh, once you want to delete something a file you have to do the manually but here in the uh, new version of the cbits it is uh, it is providing uh, everything uh, very easily uh, with the uh, file uh, delete possibility and also it has the activity uh, login and exception handling included already with the framework uh, and also uh, we know that with the existing one it doesn't have in Laravel and also we have uh, RBAC integrated with that and also the postman collection generation is included in the uh, new CBIX version but in Laravel it doesn't have right and also initial now when we go to Laravel also it doesn't need to uh, initially set up but in CBIX you have some uh, small steps to do the initial installation so I have uh, evaluated this model by giving uh, to a questionnaire to a set of developers which is in the field and I have uh, selected uh, some senior software developers to the intern set and I have evaluated it from them I have got uh, that uh, the first uh, chart which shows that if you do the normal uh, validation, normal uh, operation creation, normal application using normal Laravel, it takes more than 2.5 to 3 hours for that process. But if you go to the, uh, if you use this uh, CBIT's new version, you can do it within less than uh, one hour time period. Mostly you can uh, do in 30, 30 minutes, 40 minutes maximum. Uh, so it is uh, the repetitive task which is uh, doing by the developers is the time consuming is uh, reduced to the great extent. So, so here, uh, we, with the using of the proposed meta module, see which 4.0, uh, the prototype use case is created and could be developed in less than 30 minutes, right? So, that is uh, my evaluation. So, uh, user has to give few clicks to achieve the task. And so, the database relation also created automatically. So. Uh, from these results which I have gained from this, so uh, I have done this uh, with the 12 developers. So then 90% uh, of them confirms the easiness to set up that uh, the framework uh, in uh, CBIT's meta model. And also uh, with that, uh, from them, it's 90% agree that uh, CBIT's they could do it, and they could, they could um, create a basic application. Uh, use case uh, in less than 30 minutes. So uh, these are my uh, references which I have used and thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Lasanta. So uh, now if you have questions, uh, we can uh, Right. Um, you will be joining with us online. Yeah. Hello. Am I on the Hello. He should be available online. Uh, yeah, I'm available. Do you hear me? Yeah, he's here. Right. So if you have questions, please uh, raise it now. Right, I think the, uh, my, um, I just want to clarify first. So this is what you do, uh, this, you already have a framework, uh, which is um, Beats, no? Uh, three. C -Beats. C -Beats. C -Beats. Right, then uh, you, uh, and it does press services. So what you're trying to do is 
uh, you're going to create kind of a visual or kind of a meta yeah. that you create the rest service as you create the rest service only for CRUDs. No, it? no, it is uh, CBIS 3.0 is the one which is already uh, developed under uh, meta design. That is uh, another research which has already gone, but it is based on monolithic architecture. But my part is to get it to the uh, REST API uh, microservices. So that is the one which I have not the GUI. It is basically uh, to support microservices plus mm -hmm. the GUI. Right. Now, microservices, when you say REST, are you are you creating a REST service? That service. Is yeah. Each service. What is there in the core of the service? Like in the in the payload, uh, uh, what's the code? Is You generate the code itself for the service or it's just cut the uh, Code. No, no, it generates the, uh, the code. That means uh, once you uh, create an uh, application and yeah. once you uh, inside the application, you can create the uh, use cases. Let's say, for example, uh, we are going to create a leave application. You have a apply leave use case, right? So then you you uh, you create uh, and you have the uh, properties for that uh, use case. Okay. So once you uh, given those uh, properties, it will create that uh, the uh, use case and then the endpoints for that use case. It creates the uh, uh, database fields and all the validation, then uh, all the uh, activity login and that complete part is creating uh, by this. But uh, what about the business logic of it? Let's say if it is leave, uh, checking the leave, existing leave, getting the database, let's say, uh, can a person apply leave? Let's say there's a service to validate leave, but the person, how many leave days are there? Or that granularity of, you know, uh, creating uh, microservices, you know, you, there's a uh, yeah. you know, granularity you have to keep, create uh, based on the semantics that you are based on your users. So yeah. that, are you saying that you are, uh, doing that, generating that whole code of the REST service itself, or no. it just for the shell? It it, it for the shell uh, because uh, the here it is uh, creating the shell. Then after that, the if there are uh, more modifications, the developer has the possibility to go for the next step because it has that flexibility. Because uh, the thing here, the main focus is to reduce the number of uh, the repetitive tasks uh, doing by the developers because the developer if you know it is creating a basic shell also basic card also they takes a lot of time uh, mostly so here we have reduced it, it to greater extent within just uh, less than 30 minutes you can do it and if you have more uh, additional things if you need more code you have uh, flexibility from that onwards the developer can keep the developing and you can go to the more granularity that's how it is uh, developed so what you are proposing is a less code uh, no not yeah no. less less code uh, and reduce a repetitive task basically and also uh, the uh, monolithic architecture extend to the microservices based architecture with the rest api and you can also it uh, develop uh, once you develop it pr produce a postman collection also so which you can directly use it. So that's how it goes. Can you compare with Laravel and the related? Uh, yeah, it is Lara just a comparison with existing framework, which is more commonly used nowadays because this is PHP based development I have done. So that's why I have taken Laravel. Right. Okay. Yeah, I would like to go to one of your slides. So there you have shown that the metal metal cutting cutting machines. Yeah. Right. There are several metal cutting machines, yeah. but we don't use for everything the lathe machine, right? Yeah. So yeah. Every application has a limitation yeah. and a requirement. Yeah. So how do you capture the requirements and limitation in your system or will it come always kind of lathe machine output? No, no, no. It is just an example I have given just to show that uh, that the new knowledge is acquired in that. That's why I have taken that example to uh, show that what is included in the, what is uh, newly gained in the uh, CBITS model to just for a comparison. So that's why I included that to make it uh, understandable easily that I have gained looks included like, new knowledge. But uh, it that, looks like ultimately you will end up with having a coconut pile kind of. Uh, Thing now for everything? Uh, no, actually not. It is because uh, here the example which I have given is that is uh, 
if you need to the, now the, it is so it is uh, so that is uh, which you can cut things uh, i agree with you because lathe machine you have um, many things but uh, just i want to show that in the lathe machine again it is a new knowledge and uh, you have many things included in that uh, that is how it, it is improved but here in that c bits also what i need to express is that we have the new developer knowledge is in, uh, integrated into that to the next level because that is otherwise we can as a normal development always what is happening is the developer is developing but in here c bits we have is we have integrated the developer knowledge uh, for the repetitive task. That is what is given. No, the main problem is actually if you look at the transportation, we have buses, lorries, and three yeah. and etc. So in your case, do you ultimately propose using buses for everything transportation? No, it is basically the that's why I said it is basically the basic uh, the shell is creating. So if you want to, uh, as, as you are saying, if you want to extend it to any level, it is possible uh, after that the developer can extend it as his uh, requirement. So you, you develop a system on top of the MBC architecture provided by this uh, Laravel, no? Uh, Yes, uh, it is actually uh, MEC architecture uh, based uh, with the Laravel it is going, yeah. Yeah, so that uh, the, the whatever the resources you got from the MEC architecture provided by Laravel. Yeah. Yes, yes. Get... Yes, Laravel, uh, we, we, we are using the base framework as that and additionally it has some uh, basic commands which is if you want to generalize this one into Spring Boot, so what will happen? Uh, it is basically, if you want to get generalize to Spring Boot, it is a, a Java, no? right? So uh, the here the endpoints and all creating for the PHP base. So uh, if you want to go to the Spring Boot, you have to have a plugin for that to uh, create the endpoints. So that's how we have to do it. Yeah, that is hard bound with the Laravel framework. Yeah, because uh, this is uh, basically the uh, uh, CBIS based on the PHP. That's uh, I have taken. So, which means uh, this is you are not looking at the high level concept, but what is available, and you are trying to uh, limit to that kind of uh, environment. If you want to have a different framework to be used, the entire structure has to be redesigned. No, if it is uh, uh, the the uh, the language, this is basically the language is specific. But concept we can take. But here, the, this is language is specific. So it is basically PHP based development. So because it is the existing one was uh, based on the PHP, so that's why it is. Uh, I I I mentioned that it is extend version uh, to the next level to support the microservice architecture based on uh, the existing one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lasanta. So, okay, thank uh, you. yeah, the next presentation is uh, from uh, Sahan Randika Kulatunga, and the title of the research is Categorizing the IPv4 Addresses Space Based on Services Running on IPs. And he will be also joining with us uh, online. And now uh, you can, I mean, you can share the screen for Sahan and the space based on services running on one piece. So well, what is IPv4? IPv4 is the addressing scheme that you to establish the internet. Uh, as you know, entire internet is based on two different IP address spaces, which is IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, from these two address spaces, IPv4 is the most mature address space. Is the majority are still using IPv4. Uh, in this research, we are focusing on IPv4 addresses. And also IPv4 is divided into autonomous systems. So what is autonomous system number? Uh, 
Its IP address in IPv4 address is IANA as defined in the autonomous system number. Uh, IP addresses are grouped into autonomous system in each other autonomous systems, and each of these autonomous systems has autonomous system number. And so automatically, each IP is updated from that autonomous system number. Uh, autonomous system numbers will indicate the geolocation information and organization information for a given IP. So why IANA site ID is not enough, even though they reveal given organization information. As to answer that, uh, the way IANA is giving the geo given organization information is that they are distributing the IP packages like this. Uh, assume if I'm a cloud vendor, uh, then uh, I buy uh, 10,000 IP addresses from a particular uh, from a particular ISP. Uh, afterwards, I'm the only person who knows what I'm going to do with those IP addresses. Uh, so if we look if you look the ASN ID, it will only reveal the organization information about that particular ISP. Uh, so revealing the organization information and the geo, geo information uh, does not matter when uh, when uh, come to the uh, critical security scenarios. Uh, basically, we do not know how the end users are using those IP addresses. So what we are going to do is uh, we are going to assign a label to an IP based on the consumer level. So uh, if the by of the particular IP is a cloud service, then we call it, then we call it as cloud service IP. Likewise, we can label the IP addresses as CDN, web hosting, proxy, and VPN, etc. So what we can do by this categorization, we can build better phishing detection system, we can build better IP blacklist, and uh, we can build uh, solid ground fix, etc. Now moving to the research problem. Uh, what we are going to solve is we are going to classify. Uh, classify a given IP uh, to following uh, these high types of categories. Uh, the logos I have given below of these classes are samples uh, for these uh, for these service types. Uh, as you can see, these are the tier one vendors, which is the which is, which is most popular vendors. Uh, and these tier one vendors are already published their IP spaces in their official websites. So here is the case. if you already know the leading vendors and their and their uh, consumer address spaces, why do we need edge categorization? As you know, uh, some of the tier one vendors have published their IP addresses in their websites, but the count of but the count of the IP addresses they own is 55 to 75 million. So these IP addresses can be easily categorized by looking at the tables because they have, a, uh, they have published their IP address. But we can see that there are about 3 billion public IP address spaces available. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, the circle is significantly larger than the small, smaller circle. So we can see that there are uncountable number of services to be discovered in these unseen space. So to identify this unseen space, we can use uh, this hypothesis. So what we are going to do is uh, we are going to uh, observe the patterns uh, of these leading vendors and then uh, we are going to identify the unseen vendors and their consumer IP spaces. So moving on to the related work. Uh, these are the papers I have identified uh, as a related work for this research. So after reading those papers, uh, uh, I have identified the this research gap. Uh, there are many researchers have done about the internet wide scan, and this author has researched on discovering unexpected services and unexpected ports. Uh, but the problem with this paper is they have categorized the IP address based on service types. Uh, using the Indian wide scanning, and uh, this uh, this author uh, investigated uh, useful features in HTTP data and found some features for device specific. Uh, the problem with this approach is uh, the relying entirely on the HTTP header for classification is not very reliable. Uh, after identifying the research gap, uh, I have developed these uh, these two research questions. Now moving on to the research design. Uh, as you can see, at the first step, uh, we have uh, collected the ground truth data. And for the second step, uh, we have collected uh, collected the data from various data sources such as HTTP, DLS, Whois, and ASA. And after feature, after the feature engineering stage, we have merged these uh, ground truth and data sources to create the data set. And for the ground truth collection, uh, uh, from these vendors, we have gathered the uh, gathered their public IP ranges as the uh, for the ground truth collection, and uh, for the data collection sources, uh, uh, we have gathered the data uh, from these uh, four, four sources. 
and uh, talking about the HTT and TLS balance uh, collection, uh, the banner, uh, banner data collection. Uh, as you know, in scanning the whole IPv4 address space on single IP, single computer is a difficult task, and it took about eight to nine hours to finish. So we have parallelized the scan by dividing the IPv4 IP address space into seven subnets to reduce the time for a scan. So in this pipeline, we have used uh, Terraform tool to provision the seven GPU virtual machines. These are seven GPU virtual machines, and after creating the seven virtual machines, then Ansible tool will run the scan scripts uh, from this controller. Each DCP uh, virtual machine uh, scan the scan the each subnet of the IPv4 address space, and after that, the result of these scans will be uh, transferred to this DCP uh, storage worker. And uh, this uh, who is data is collected by the virus local API, and uh, ASN data is collected from the IP2 ASN database. Uh, talking about identifying useful features, uh, this HTTP and TLS manners contains nearly thousand to thousand five hundred views. So we need to find out what are the most useful fields from this uh, data set. Uh, so uh, for that, we have used field count as a metric and found out uh, the most frequently uh, used headers. So moving on to the results. Uh, these are the frequent fields I have identified in this data set uh, for each of these classes. Uh, and this is the finalized feature table. As, as you can see, there are four types of features. Which is HTTP, TLS, Proton Systems, and who is. And uh, after identifying the feature vector, uh, I have uh, trained these uh, machine learning models. And uh, from these models, we have selected random forest classifier uh, as the best uh, classifier since it achieves the best accuracy and enhanced score. And this is the ROC score for the uh, selected random forest classifier. And this is the confusion matrix and the classification report. Uh, for the uh, for the selected kind of forest classifier and moving to the model evaluation uh, we use uh, we use the we use dimension dimensional reduction algorithm such as tsni and pca so by looking at these clusters uh, we can visually we can visually see that there are clear and separate clusters for a classification for a accurate uh, classification and this is a 2d visualization and this is a 3d visualization and uh, talking about the uh, impact of the adverse adversarial attacks we need to find out how the model is affected when supplying when clear features as you know http headers are not very reliable and the network administrators can change this to a prevent attacks to find out how the feature manipulation affects our model we have dropped the features one by one to see the accuracy change we can see that uh, single feature manipulation does not change accuracy in a large value. So uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, then we have selected the 10 million IP uh, random IP sample and run the model for this IP, uh, IP sample. Uh, so uh, then we have identified the percentages of each service type which are included in this 10 million random IP sample and this is the table for that. Now moving to the conclusion. Uh, so uh, for the first question, we have identified we have generated correlation matrices and uh, correlation matrices generated PDF and CDF plots to show the correlation. And for the second question, we have identified the feature vector table by using this feature vector set. And we have developed random for a classifier, which gives a ninety four percent accuracy for the unpopular values. And for the conclusion, uh, talking about the conclusion, uh, we have developed a way to do the parallelizing by scan. And we have identified the correlation of these service types and identified the feature vector feature sets for the classification. And we have trained, trained multiple machine learning models and selected the kind of classifier as the best one. And now we're talking about uh, future works. Uh, we can understand we can uh, understand the nature of the ASNs by using this model, and we can identify more features to improve the uh, accuracy of the classifier. And we currently this solution works only for IPv4. But we can expand this solution to IPv6 address space as well. And these are the references. And uh, thank you for listening. And if you if you have questions, you can ask now.
Yeah, uh, just a more of a clarification. Uh, uh, the, the, what are the parameters you are taken for the, uh, the specification from the uh, HTTP header, is it TCP header? Yeah, it is HTTP header and uh, TLS header and AS, AS information and uh, and the who is information. These four types of uh, so about about how many thirty parameters there? Yeah, you are using yeah. them to do your clustering. Yeah, to classes. Okay, and you used initially uh, uh, to using those popular vendors. Yeah, as the as the base classification. Yeah. It's yeah. A, so if you get a SN number the, by default, the IP is predefined. Eh? Sorry? If you know the SN number, so in your research, you got the IP and search for the AS number assigned to that one, no? Yeah. Where, while you are uh, collecting data. But if you know the SN number, I, uh, IP is already defined. Eh? So ASN yeah. that region. So uh, what are the, the most uh, valuable features you identify in this system? Uh, in this research, uh, uh, the HTTP headers are the most uh, 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 most uh, valuable ones uh, I have got. What are they? What are they? You mean? Yeah, HTTP. What are the most valuable? Uh, so you don't go to TCP level information. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, it is a. Uh, you have via field and uh, the net size and the status code and the server these these are the most important ones so how about uh, normal firewall they, they don't look at those features uh, sorry can you repeat the question i mean you are talking about security no yeah so what we are going to do whether you want to know this is a vpn thing or come from this yeah. ASN number or some kind of uh, CDN or something like that. So you suspicious some of the like VPN, uh, if the data is encrypted and going to there is some much chance, uh, the high, higher chance of having an attack from that one. Yeah, yeah. So your classification problem is that one. That's why you classify the yeah, yeah, one, because one of these five. Yeah. Because of most after of the that, time, uh, after happen. that you can hand, after that you are handing over to the firewall level. or you you are talking about what is your conclusion? Uh, the conclusion is the uh, normal IP classification. So uh, it it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, talking about the uh, firewall level classification. Uh, no, I mean you have to oh, now. If you classify, the first problem is classifying whether it's mm. come one of these five. So uh, if you find, okay, this is a VPN related. Uh, 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 so can you explain after that what is happening in your... You after the classification? Know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, after the classification, uh, we, we have built a, build a model. Then, uh, then uh, we can... Uh, uh, we can uh, get a random IP and then... Uh, then we need to uh, get those or uh, get those uh, four types of features. Uh, then uh, we can uh, input that to the uh, model. Then uh, it will uh, classify it as a VPN proxy or like that. Yeah. No, just out of curiosity, the ten thousand IP is that where did you run it on AWS? Uh, uh, this was run on a GCP virtual machine. Okay, and you mean. Uh, Ah, okay. Otherwise, if it is there, you, you would have got blacklisted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, it's not clear to me again, after the classification, what is the next step? That is not clear to me. The, even you explained it. There is no okay. step or just the classification. Is there yeah. any other... Uh, uh, Afterwards, yeah. would there be yeah. any other step? Uh, uh, we can use it as a business purpose because uh, uh, if we get an uh, IP, then uh, uh, then we can uh, we can input that as an IP. Then uh, we can get classified classified as a VPN proxy like that. Uh, the business purpose is that uh, we can uh, it is like an uh, early intrusion detection system because uh, 
if the if the visitor of the website comes from a vpn ip then uh, then uh, we can uh, most monitor monitor them yeah okay thank you thank you sahan and uh, thank you very much for the questions let's move to the next paper and uh, the paper title is enhancing source camera identification through higher order wavelet statistics so uh, the paper presenter is uh, asanka sayakkar and uh, he will be joining with us here physically Uh, good afternoon everybody um, um, i see lots of tired faces here so but uh, that's fine because it, this will be a quick and dirty like quick presentation so um, i hope we can quickly finish this um, yeah so this work um, titled enhancing uh, source camera identification through higher order wavelet statistics as you can see the first author is uh, Ms. Gamage and then Dr. Kasundi Soisa and myself. Um, unfortunately, the first author couldn't be here, so that's why I'm like kind of filling the gap here. So uh, I think I'm not the best person to go into details of this. So, but uh, I, I will um, like uh, at least I think I can consider myself successful if uh, I get some of you to read the paper. Like uh, if I can uh, raise the curiosity, that would be good enough for me, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, imagine that uh, you are a law enforcement officer, police officer, and you are dealing with a um, uh, criminal case. And now there's a suspect, and most likely the suspect um, has a smartphone as well. Um, now you have the uh, smartphone, you have seized it, and now you need to investigate it. And this is where digital forensics comes into play a role. You need to analyze the device, what kind of data available inside it, and um, 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 whether you can get any hint, hints about the crime through that, right? Um, uh, so when you are doing digital forensic analysis of the phone, of this uh, smartphone, uh, you may come across photographs in this phone, right? And some of them can be uh, related or linked to uh, the crime. And uh, one... Um, common question that arise in digital forensic investigations nowadays is you come across a, a photograph in a device and um, the owner of the device claims that uh, that's not mine. Like maybe somebody sent it to me through WhatsApp or whatever, or maybe somebody planted that uh, evidence photograph into my device. So that happens. Uh, so it's really difficult to find the origin of a photograph. Even if you find uh, a photograph in a computer or smartphone, it's really difficult to um, verify whether it was taken by that device or it was copied to it, right? So what is the origin of um, uh, the source of a photograph? That's, that's the problem, right? So that's, that's a very common problem that we come across in digital forensic investigations. Uh, and um, th there's, a, there's a way to solve this. Um, uh, our manufacturing process is not perfect. So whenever electronic devices are manufactured, uh, especially things like sensors, you know, uh, photo, uh, like camera sensors, these are not perfect. So due to the um, fabrication process, uh, due to the imperfections, the same manufacturer making uh, same, like multiple devices of the same model, um, makes little uh, like plant little unintentional um, imperfections into the sensor, uh, in, into these devices. So because of that, if you take two um, camera sensors, um, um, the um, um, uh, how sensitive each pixel in this camera sensor 
is different across different types of cameras. Uh, for example, if you take a particular uh, make and model, right? You can take multiple devices of that same model. And um, it turns out that uh, each sensor has its own unique sensitivity. So if you look at each pixel, each pixel has its own unique uh, sensitivity, which, uh, which is not easy to um, like keep consistent across multiple you know, devices they make in the factory. Um, we call it actually photo response non-uniformity noise, uh, PRNU. Uh, so PRNU noise um, is actually a, 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 a kind of a puff. We call these kind of things puffs, physical unclonable functions. Uh, during the manufacturing process, you introduce this thing and th th there's a sensitivity pattern in the sensor which you cannot replicate. Like even the same manufacturer make another of such device and it doesn't have that PRNU noise, but it's hidden inside the sensitivity. Uh, I mean, in, in the camera sensor. So this thing can serve as a sensor, right? Uh, yeah, so in this particular work, um, enhancing source camera identification work, uh, what we have done is uh, we have um, um, built a methodology. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, we have built a methodology uh, to, uh, to extract uh, the PRNU noise and then based on that, identify the origin of a photograph. For example, in the crime scene, you, you have a device, it has a photo uh, in its storage and you need to find out whether this photo was taken by this camera itself. Right. So um, in this process, what uh, like briefly happens is like uh, um, uh, you have an original image, right? So you send it through a wave load transformation and then you have the transformed image uh, which embeds the noise of the camera, right? And uh, you do a little bit of signal processing, apply wavelet-based uh, filters, right? Uh, and through this, this process, you remove all the noise. And then uh, you can take the difference between the original photograph and the denoised uh, photograph and extract the PRNU noise. It, it's a bit uh, complicated process there. I'm not going into details of it. Um, and, and you can extract the PRNU noise, right? Once you have the PRNU noise, this can act as the signature of that particular camera, right? Uh, so once you have this uh, uh, signature pattern, then um, uh, you can do lots of things. Uh, for example, you can do machine learning, right? You can train machine learning models to identify a particular device, right? You have lots of photographs taken from a particular camera and you extract the PRNU noise. And um, we use a technique here called the higher order wavelet uh, uh, statistics uh, on this PRNU noise. And based on that, uh, we extract, um, uh, we train machine learning models, which uh, we can use to uniquely identify the device. So that's the basic idea. Right? Uh, obviously, I'm not going into details. So in this work, um, 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 the evaluation was done using our own data set. Uh, multiple devices were used uh, uh, to collect data images. And then uh, uh, the PRNU noise was extracted uh, from each camera and then uh, trained machine learning models in order to see how, how far we can uh, distinguish between devices, right? Uh, so we have, uh, you can see in this picture, but uh, in this screen, you can't see it. Like uh, uh, in this one, you, uh, uh, if you see in the paper, you will see the printed paper, you will see that there's noise patterns. Here it's just black uh, like uh, squares. Um, so those are extracted uh, PRNU noise. So using this data set, um, an evaluation was done and some of the highlights of this work is that um, if you take cameras from different brands and models uh, like uh, uh, wide across uh, all kinds of cameras and models, it turns out that uh, you can uh, distinguish a particular make and model uniquely up to like 95% accuracy. And I think it's a bit uh, obvious because like if it is a particular make and model, the manufacturer has its, its own pattern of doing that. So it's, uh, it's unique. Um, so it's more unique. Now, if you take uh, a particular same brand and then uh, uh, within the same brand, different models, then the accuracy is a bit low, uh, but uh, it's coming from the same manufacturer. So probably it's going through the similar machinery in the same factory. So uh, we can distinguish to a, but a lower level. 
And finally, if you take a camera of the same make and model, right? Let's say a particular smartphone model and multiple of them, um, the accuracy is even lower because they, they are more similar, but still um, their PRNU noise remains in there. So that, that's some of the highlights finding of this paper. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I cannot go more than that into the details of this work. Um, but I hope I invite all of you to read the paper and, and um, yeah, and direct questions to Slido. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, okay sir. Yes, sir. The basic assumption is that no two devices can be produced with the same photo. Yes. Yes. So th this is called actually puff. So lots of people use this for various purposes, actually. For example, you can use this as a kind of a key, a unique key, like the manufacturer introduced this noise. And even if somebody else really want to replicate this thing, they can't. That, that's the, that's the, the thing. So uh, because the manufacturing process introduced it. So yeah. This yeah. only way of transfer, only way, way of transfer, like the, the wavelet transformation you use. Yes. Yeah, any other possible like Fourier or anything uh, yeah. can be tested? Yeah, in the literature, there are various kinds of approaches used. So this wavelet-based wavelet higher order statistics is the like the contribution of this work. Like there are various. Uh, no, uh, actually, in the literature, there are multiple approaches, right? Like uh, Fourier transformation and various other ways. And actually, the PRNU noise is not the only kind of noise in camera sensors. There are some other types of noise as well. Um, and in the literature, people have used that kind of approaches as well. So the contribution of this work is coming from uh, using PRNU noise and also using a uh, higher order wavelet statistics uh, as the feature vector um, for for your uh, machine learning yeah so out of curiosity a pr a pr any noise is it for that model of that camera that means is it for the device or it is for that because they may be manufacturing those cameras yeah that goes to with different devices let's say android uh, different samsung this e version yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, it, 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 the signature is for the particular camera sensor. sensor okay. So there can be different manufacturers using yeah. the same camera sensor, yeah. but still uh, the PRNU pattern for a particular sensor, sensor. is unique. Right. So for example, same manufacturer, same model, you have the same camera model and I have the same camera model, but PRNU noise in your camera is different from mine. So, okay. so that's when you did that, um, for example, devices that you have got, and you identified that it was yes. clear. It's the same noise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a range, or it's a uh, when you calculate it, it's a it's a range. It's yeah. Got, it's like a kind of probabilistic. Like right. you know, when we use machine learning, it's like it's not not always the same, but like across large number of data, it, there's a pattern. So you are trying to say that uh, it's like uh, fingerprints. The yeah. image of fingerprints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you said PRNU is one of the types. And yes. You, you selected PRNU. Yes. And the um, wavelet statistics. Uh, so the idea is uh, the uh, camera identification enhancing that aspect. Yes. So why PRNU and wavelet? Is it because they two go together or? why another noise and another mechanism. Yeah. So why these two for this particular purpose? Yeah, so uh, th there are other types, of, like I think there's one called FPN, uh, like fixed pattern noise. That kind of noise patterns are there. According to the literature, uh, PRNU noise is the like the, the current like hot topic in this field. That's one thing, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then why uh, this particular feature like extraction? Yeah, I think um, it's just a kind of unique approach. It's like um, there are different kinds of feature extraction techniques, uh, like uh, use of uh, like wavelet, high order wavelet uh, statistics is one way. So um, this may not be the best way. And of course, like when you look at the size of the data set, I think uh, we need more like more experiments to like claim that it is so yeah. now you consider only five six cl five classes here yeah yeah but you said each and every device is different 
Yeah, yeah. So if you want to have a multi-class classification, these classes are infinite. Yes. How you deal with that problem? Yeah, I think uh, we can narrow it down to a binary classification by saying, uh, like in the crime scene, we have we found one device, right? It's a matter of whether this photo was taken from this device or anything else. So, uh, um, so, so then you have to feed that device as well. Yeah, we have to possess. You have that to device. retrain the model. Sorry. You have to retrain the model with the current device. Yes, like in the, in the law enforcement. So you said in each and every device yeah. in the same yeah. manufacturer yeah. is yeah different. Yes. Noise. Yeah. So, for example, let's say I'm the police officer. I come across a new device, and it has a photograph. Uh, I need to take lots of photographs and create a data set and um, um, identify the PRNU noise uh, of that camera sensor. So then, whatever the suspicious photographs I come across, which I suspect to be taken from this camera, I can verify using that machine learning model. That's the idea. Yeah, whether it's from this camera or anything else, so it's binary classification. But now, now, now in uh, fingerprints, about uh, two different people in a million, they may be different. Yes. <laughs> so there yeah. may be a slight chance of having the same things in two separate yeah. devices. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the probability of having two similar patterns is like extremely low. So. Yeah, so it's it's like still probability. So, so yeah. the, the problem would be how this can be used in courts. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. So actually, digital forensics has this problem. Like you know, um, find, things we find are like not concrete enough. Uh, always, like there's always there's this little doubt. Yeah. Accuracy and evaluation was it shown here? And not really. I just jumped into numbers. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the exact process of doing that, I think I'm not the best person to... Any any yeah. idea regarding... Uh, yeah, idea? yeah. So uh, this uh, like photograph, I mean, the data set was created using these cameras, like uh, our own data set. The reason is uh, uh, the common uh, like uh, data sets available out there are like kind of outdated. You know, they are taken from different kinds of old uh, cameras, so they, they are not very relevant, first thing. And then um, um, most of the times in these kind of image data sets, um, the, the exact camera model and the sensor model are not recorded anywhere. Like that, that's not some information that uh, they are not interested in. So this data set was created and then using that um, uh, machine learning models were trained for different kinds of scenarios. Like uh, you can see like there are two devices with the same uh, make and model uh, and there are uh, like galaxy devices, which are coming from the same manufacturer, but different models. And then there's uh, Huawei device, which is like entirely from a different uh, like uh, man manufacturer. So it has kind of variety. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, we need more data, obviously. To process this one, this transformation Python libraries are used. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's so there, for. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the, for example, to extract like uh, wavelet based features, there are libraries and tools to do that. So it's a matter of, you know, building the pipeline to do the whole process. Yes. Uh, we can check the device, you know, like if we possess the device, we can find its spec and find out, you know, what exactly the camera sensor went into this particular device. So that's the only way I think. I don't think that, you know, this, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, no, I don't think metadata contains the exact, like, you know, camera sensor model. I don't think, but the device model will be there probably in, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Asanka. And the next presentation is from Adesh Kulatunga. And the title for this paper is Bandwidth Based Heavily Loaded Light Path Protection for IPMPLS over Optical Networks. So, Adish will be joining with us online. So, the session is ready to uh, uh, start his presentation.
Hello everyone. I am Madhish Kulatunga. Today I am here to present about our research project idea. Its title is Bandwidth-based heavy loaded light path protection for IP MPLS optical networks. Our team include K Mohan, LTRJ Prabodhana, PMMN Patiraj, and YMTL PL Yapa. First of all, let me tell you the summary of our project. There are already existing survival routing methods in optical networks. but those are having a set of disadvantages we wanted to come up with a solution which minimize those disadvantages so that resulted our project that's the brief idea today i'll be delivering this presentation under these sections so let's begin with the background you can see a diagram in the left corner of this slide it is a simple optical network it is having a set of nodes and links these nodes have both optical cross connectors and level switch routers and the blue color links are the optical fibers in this network wavelength division multiplexing takes place it means that it enables parallel transmission on multiple wavelengths on the same fibers since there are optical cross connectors level switch routers and wavelength division multiplexing we can further divide the huge capacity in the fiber cables and create some logical paths these are named as light paths within a light path wavelength is uniform in this slide you can see an image in the top right corner it shows that the light paths can be further divided into sub paths those sub paths are named as table switch paths so simply we call them as lsps within a light path there can be multiple lsps In the left diagram, the red color paths are light paths, and the green color sub paths are LSPs. Those LSPs can traverse through multiple light paths with different wavelengths. For an example, LSP one goes through ABC light path and CD light path. Now I am going to give you a brief idea about what survival routing is. As you know, in a network, failures might occur at any point of time. we must be able to provide services even though there's a failure that ability is known as survivability why survivability is important it is because there are many real world scenarios which needs this survivability for a quick recovery for an example medical surgeon performing a surgery remotely in here surgeon is at one place patient is at another place so the surgeon needs a HD live video. Such network connections require high quality of service and huge bandwidth. Especially a quick recovery is needed if a failure occurs. This is only one example. So how can we come up with this survivability? For that, we can use backup paths. For light paths, with backup light paths and LSPs are with backup LSPs. This slide shows it clearly. for survivability there are two main protection approaches first one is lsp layer protection here each primary lsp is given with a backup lsp next protection approach is light path layer protection in this case each primary light path is given a backup light path so both these approaches are having its own advantages and disadvantages this is an already existing hybrid scheme of a previous research this scheme use both lsp layer protection and light path layer protection they say that lsp layer protection is compulsory and the light path layer protection is optional to decide whether they are going to give the light path layer protection or not they have defined a term that and that term is heavy loaded light path it says that if a primary light path is having a number of lsps than a threshold value that light path is heavy loaded if a light path is heavy loaded it will be given a light path layer protection for example if a light path is having two lsps it is heavy loaded if a light path is having three lsps it is heavy loaded likewise if the light path is heavy loaded it will be given a backup light path but this hybrid scheme there are some issues one is network resources are wasted the other one issue is 
some critical parts might not get protected therefore to overcome those issues we came with a solution for that we investigated a new definition for heavy loaded light paths so in a proposed solution we also use a lsp layer protection and a light path layer protection here also the lsp layer protection is compulsory and the light path level protection is optional but we proposed a new definition for heavy loaded light paths we are considering the bandwidth usage within light path for this new definition let me explain how that works it's like this if 50% bandwidth of the primary light path is consumed by its lsps the light path is heavy loaded if 60% of the bandwidth of a primary light path is consumed by lsps that light path is heavy loaded likewise we are considering the bandwidth usage as the threshold for our new definition here are some challenges we faced during our project since this definition is completely new one we won't precisely say how its booking performance will be will it be acceptable will our solution be better than previous ones all those were un- unknown initially these were our main objectives find its blocking performance resource wastage levels and heavy loaded light path protection probability and these are the five main performance matrices we used to evaluate our new definition they are average primary bandwidth usage on heavy loaded light paths average number and percentage of heavily loaded light paths average number of primary lsps on heavy loaded light paths blocking probability and the last one is heavy loaded light path protection probability to evaluate our solution we implemented a simulation using c++ language we separated the whole network into three main layers and doubly linked lists were the basic structure of those layers and we used digistrass algorithm to find the shortest paths for light paths and lsps then we created the lsp requests the request arrival follows poisson distribution where the holding time of the requests follow exponential distribution each lsp request has a source node destination node bandwidth value and the holding time this slide shows those parameters we use nsf net network topology for the simulation since it is a standard network now i'll present you about the results we obtained this is the basic structure of the graphs we used to get results x axis x axis shows the erlang value erlang is a standard unit which is used to measure traffic load and the y axis shows one of the five performance matrices which i mentioned previously these curves belong either to number of lsp based definition or bandwidth based definition or combination of bandwidth based definition and number of lsp based definition each dot in the curves are average of three values to get a one value we used 250000 lsp requests the average primary bandwidth usage on heavy light paths is here the next one is average number of heavy loaded light paths likewise here are remaining graphs i'll further explain about them in the conclusion section we could achieve a goal under these milestones also from here onwards i'll mention the conclusions which we could come up with first one is bandwidth based definition or proposed definition actually it is efficient in terms of average primary bandwidth usage on heavy loaded light paths as you can see in the diagram the average primary bandwidth usage on heavy light paths number of lsp based definition for the previous research definition is 60% which means that average of 40% bandwidth is wasted but in our solution bandwidth based definition that value is 80% and the average bandwidth wastage is 20% so this clearly shows that our definition has achieved its main objective of reducing the network bandwidth wastage second conclusion says as predicted before bandwidth based definition creates more number of heavy loaded light paths than 
number of LSP based definition. Here you can see the average number of heavy loaded light bulbs in previous definition is lower than the proposed definition. In terms of broken probability, the behavior of both the definitions are similar at high traffic loads. At low traffic loads, there is a big difference in these values. Actually, the broken probability, is, broken probability of bandwidth based definition is a bit higher. It is because is declaring more number of heavy loaded light paths, but it is in acceptable range. Finally, these are the references which we referred. So here comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Adish. And any questions from the audience? Adish, I would like to know uh, how can we generalize this solution for real world applications? Like I, as I uh, heard, this is attempted over a simulation simulated uh, infrastructure, right? Yeah. So, uh, what sort of challenges we would experience if we try to apply this to a real world application and implement this in the real world? Uh, actually, uh, if we do it in a real world, the first question. The, actually, the internet service providers like Mobile or Dialog, they would ask uh, how would our solution uh, behave in a real network. So at that time, for oh, that's why we have come up with this simulation. So for our simulation, we have created the uh, actual network. Actually, in a network, there are LSP requests are created. So most of the time, those are the request arrival follows uh, Poisson distribution. So, so when you are creating our simulation, we use those distributions. So since we use that uh, distribution, we could uh, obtain a very most, most accurate results. So the internet service providers can refer our uh, graphs or results and they can come up with, a, uh, they can come up with, they can decide what they have to do. So actually most of the, Difficulties are avoided. So since we have got the results, so actually they have to do the implementation and decide the their network according to their choices. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you, Adish, and uh, thank you for sharing your. Uh, research findings with us and I wish you all the very best for your future uh, researching uh, careers. So let's move to the next presentation. The Thank presentation you very much. is uh, about modeling and prediction of pain related neural firings using deep learning. The presenter is uh, G.Y. Veera Singha. So, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. So, I'm Gagan Vira Singha. So, I'll be presenting the, the study of only and prediction of pain related neural firings using deep learning. So, these are the fourth of this paper. And uh, these, I'll be going through these topics for this presentation. So, first of all, I started the mot introduction motivation. As let's talk about pain. Like, pain is a sensation that all of human beings as us have been through, and it can cause by a lot of things. So, as it's actually a very unpleasant sense of emotional experience. And it's actually can vary from like mid to severe pain. So also, even if the pain is caused by the same stimulation, it can be very intensity from person to person. Therefore, it's very highly personal subjective. So talking about pains, generally, there are two types of pains, uh, two categories of pains based on duration, based on pathological mechanism. And talking of pain, there are only five types of pain. Acute pain, chronic pain, uh, neuropathy pain, nociceptive pain, and radicular pain. So in this research, I'll be only considering the acute and chronic pain, which are the uh, time-based duration pain. And talking about acute pain, acute pain are the pain that are very short period of time, such as we pinch ourselves, we cut ourselves, we hit ourselves, those kind of pain. 
and chronic pains are pain that have a longer period of time such as back pains neck pains like knee pains that which are like more than 6 months so it can be constant or intermittent as well so talking about neural paths and how the sensory experience we get it if we touch a hot iron or any pain simulation thing that message will be going through our nervous system to the spinal cord to the brain stem and for the brain and that information will be processed and we then we get the process, uh, the pain sensation so for that to identify then the I'm talking about neural tech in techniques there are multiple techniques but we use eeg because eeg is a non invasive method and non spatial high temporal resolution and very portable and cost effective and most commonly used in this neuro uh, mapping areas and uh, talking about methods of estimation pain actually we can in the real uh, real and in the current situation actually pain is uh, get taken by self report and clinical judgment but think of a situation like the self reports are unreliable and unavailable like if we can't communicate the pain and also clinical judgment are assessed biased over and underestimated as well from these kind of things the, it will be tough to properly answer the treat the pain and so result in different health issues as well and also super for the discomfort and complications as well so from that come into the research problem so we will be trying to uh, address the how can pain be assessed in the absence of self report and clinical observation we are going to research there are some studies done in this area but only of particular pain such as acute pain chronic pain and there were only two studies done in deep learning in brain base for the acute pain all the studies has only done for either to classify pain or no pain or the intensity of the pain and they have used support vector machine multivariate classifiers uh, linear discriminators random first to those kind of things to classify uh, acute pain only acute pain so uh, for going to chronic pain in here also there were only studies done to either classify pain or no pain or either the intensity of pain where they have used support vector machines artificial neural network uh, those kind of methods and talking about deep learning methods there are only two papers done in this pain area and th- these two papers are actually only done for acute pain only and they have used convolutional neural networks and lstm based uh, only and to classify pain and no pain as well as intensity of the pain so from that comes the research gap even though pain prediction has done using machine learning deep learning has not been investigated must must in uh, this area and there has been no study done specifically classify chronic and acute pain only a particular pain has been studied so therefore a model can be created to predict acute and chronic pain and the accuracy of this can be improved through deep learning so from that coming to research question i will be addressing the questions of how can eeg features and frequency band characterize determine different pain sensations as well as how can localize neural fires on brain different pain uh, by analyzing the eeg data using appropriate algorithms and how to model the pain related neural findings using deep learning so of the research pattern evaluation so i'll be going through this uh, design pipeline so talking about data sets initially i used two uh, eeg data sets so which one there was the acute pain and this both of the, these data sets were done by the same author and central research scientist so for the uh, first data set which is acute pain which is done with laser simulation and uh, for second data set it was for the chronic pain and this pain uh, this data set had also had the data for the healthy patients as well so uh, this kind of chronic and healthy patients data eeg data so for the second step we cannot use the raw eeg data for the analysis part so because it can consist of lot of junk data as well as non filtered laser so because of we need to do the pre processing where we use down sample to the 50 hertz and use high high pass filters and notch filters as well as independent component analysis and attribution and also we visually in, uh, inspect and remain remove uh, the remaining bad signals which actually we try to focus to the wanted signal and remove the unwanted signal as well so from that we actually to do the energy we actually used two uh, feature extraction method which is a partisan factorial dimension as for the growth activities and we extracted features from those functionalities and uh, so the fun, uh, feature extracted data and to uh, verify our uh, method we actually try to see whether there are two different brain areas are activated for the, those two different pains so for that we did source localization we imported this acute and chronic pain differently to the source localization we using using slorata functionality and get the average response and see whether the different type of brain areas are activated for the different pains so uh, for the evolution model we use this uh, accuracy confusion matrix question recall for the classification so uh, talking about results and validation first of all start with the source localization so as i mentioned we actually yes, separately went to the uh, source localization for acute and chronic pain 
So for the acute pain, we took the highest pain stimulations done in that patient. So from that, we can see that uh, from the average estimations, uh, left side of the brain has been activated more in the acute pain. And getting the overall estimation, we can see that that's yeah, the same in here as well. And going to the MRI images, to 2D deep deep images, we can see that the left side of the brain is more activated in the acute pain. So going to chronic pain. And for this, we actually took the 10 seconds interval and get the average response. And here we can see that the back side of the brain is more activated in this uh, chronic pains. And uh, going to the MRI image, it's very the um, deep brain areas as well as the back pain, the back areas of the brain is more activated in this uh, chronic pains. So from that, we can get the some conclusion where there are different brain areas are activated for acute and chronic pain. So from that, it ends the process of that it can be classified differently. So uh, for that, for the classification part, we actually proposed an LSTM based model where we use LSTM based with using the two feature extraction methods for the PFD and growth activities, which actually consists of 130 uh, features per test. And we try to classify healthy, chronic, and acute pain through those two categories. And we did a 20 to, uh, 80 to 20 uh, data split with 500, we tried 500 epochs with uh, four cross validations. And we use checkpoint method, which actually get the highest trained accurate model win, win the, uh, throughout the test training, which will be used in testing and evolution. So we actually achieved an 91.26 accuracy in classifying acute, chronic, and healthy patients. And these are learning curvatures. So we can see that, that we get the highest training uh, accurate model and we use that for testing. So this is the confusion matrix. We can see that healthy classification is with, with no errors, but with small in uh, classifying accurate and chronic pains, very little errors in that. And from that, we can come to the conclusion where uh, we found out that different brain areas are activated in this acute and chronic pain, as well as our LST model with both PFD and growth activity, uh, activity features extracted methods achieved an accuracy of 99.29 percentage. So for the future works, we can actually uh, classify pain, different types of pain, such as the other pain methods from the five, five types of pain, as well as from these advances, this, these kind of models, we can actually try to see what brain uh, body area is uh, caused from the pain. And also further, we can increase the performance as well. So thank you very much. Questions from the audience? So did you try any event related? Uh, I mean, uh, did you try any statistical methods or like ERPs, event related potentials? Uh, I think you'd like, can you elaborate more? Okay, so uh, you are going with the uh, deep learning or machine learning approach. Yeah. How about traditional statistical methods or like ERPs when it comes to EGIP processing? Uh, one is common method is ERPs, event related potentials. Uh, it, can, it can be done, but uh, so we went through the basic models as well, but we didn't get the accuracy that we wanted. So that's why we went to deep learning methods. And yeah, so. Okay, so. Uh, uh, how about the pre-processing uh, pipeline? Yeah. Uh, what kind of feature extraction algorithm you use? So we use this for feature extraction part. We use this growth and PFD, which actually are the new trend, uh, like the new coming uh, feature extraction methods. But there are some other methods as well. So, but we use these methods for like to the novelty part as well. So uh, yeah. the reason behind that, like. Uh, if we get variable transform, we have a uh, variable resolution. Uh, yeah. If you take uh, free transform, it's a, it's a fixed resolution. That's why uh, I yeah. think you can cannot use it. Yeah, uh, we can use those things. Actually, in previous studies, they have used it. And okay. there were some studies done in this uh, EEG data that used PFD and growth, which actually has uh, achieved more accuracy using those things. So that's why we went through that part to apply to pain as well to achieve more accuracy in that area. So that's why we used it. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Gagana. So uh, we will be heading to the next presentation, which is the last uh, presentation for the session. And the presenter is uh, Ishara Disanayake. And the title of the presentation is uh, A Generation of Dataset Towards an Anomaly-Based Intrusion Detection System to Detect Denial of Sleep uh, Attacks in Internet of Things. So he'll be joining with us online. So uh, the presentation will be uh, yeah, yeah. Over to you, Ishara.
Hello everyone, I'm Nishar Disanayaka. This is our presentation uh, with the paper ID number 10 uh, and the uh, title of uh, a generation of a data set towards an anomaly based intrusion detection system to detect denial of sleep attacks in Internet of Things. So let's discuss what Internet of Things is. Uh, basically, the Internet of Things is a network of physical objects with electronic circuits embedded within their architecture, which allows these physical objects to communicate with each other. So this Internet of Things allows the computer systems to make readings on their uh, physical environments and convert them into uh, uh, digital readings and use these uh, digital readings in the information generation process and use this information generation uh, information generated uh, in a useful manner and also in addition to that this uh, internet of things uh, make uh, available for the computer systems to change uh, certain readings uh, certain parameters in their physical environments with the help of uh, the actuators connected to the uh, these smart objects in these uh, sensor networks. So uh, this IoT is not a, a completely new technology for the current world. It's been there for a few years, uh, few uh, few uh, years now, uh, and this has been widely adopted in many areas like smart homes, smart cities, smart healthcare, intelligent transportation, and many other uh, more areas. So the problem uh, is these devices are designed in a way that uh, it is much smaller uh, because sometimes these uh, devices are equipping uh, some uh, smaller devices like uh, uh, wearable computing devices. So, uh, so the, by the nature, there, there, there is a requirement uh, the requirement of having these uh, devices uh, as much as possible. So this leads to some uh, limitations like limitation of the hardware, like processing and storage uh, capacities and the battery power that they are having. Uh, for, the, uh, for the problem of having limited processing power and storage cap capabilities and uh, network bandwidth, so there are some uh, certain uh, other solutions are there like cloud computing for computing and edge computing. But uh, when you are concerning about limited battery life, uh, it's a concern here. Uh, so it's up to the Mac protocol, uh, Mac layer protocol to uh, preserve the uh, uh, battery life that it is having. Uh, so various Mac layer protocols have their own strategies to uh, come up with different uh, techniques to save their uh, battery life. So some of the, uh, those examples are SMAC, uh, TMAC, BMAC, XMAC, and Quantic Mac. So these uh, protocols have their own way of saving their battery life. So uh, what, what they are doing is something like they put these uh, uh, sensor, uh, sensor nodes uh, into a, a duty cycle called uh, duty duty cycle uh, where in these duty cycles the uh, the, the sensor net uh, sensor nodes uh, listen for uh, the ongoing traffic and uh, do whatever they have to do and go to a sleep mode when they are in an idle uh, so uh, so they can uh, work for extended uh, lifetime so we can extend the lifetime by putting them in, uh, devices into a sleep. Uh, so likewise, uh, so they can preserve their battery life. Uh, but the problem is uh, with the uh, limited uh, resources, we are unable to provide the solid um, uh, Mac layer protocol to preserve this uh, battery life. So with the uh, um, with this, uh, so there are uh, various type of attacks that we can uh, launch in order to deplete battery power that uh, these sensor networks has. So the first one is the barrage attack. Uh, so where we like uh, send a series of legitimate requests to exhaust the uh, uh, battery power of these sensor nodes uh, by intentionally. So the attacker intentionally creates a series of legitimate uh, requests where we send uh, resource hungry uh, legitimate requests uh, very frequently to uh, exhaust this battery power of the sensor nodes. And synchronization attack is something like uh, when we do have this uh, Synchronous protocols like SMAC, TMAC. So they, they they perform virtual clusters. So in these virtual clusters, all the nodes, sensor nodes, uh, come to go to sleep at the same time and come back to uh, online uh, uh, to perform communication and sensors. Uh, so synchronization attack is something like uh, uh, sending uh, compromised uh, sync messages to uh, jammed uh, 
uh, listen sleep cycles of cells and also uh, based on the misalignments so the uh, uh, there can be uh, ex uh, uh, exhausted battery uh, life so a simulation uh, uh, done uh, yeah, by uh, Babuchi and Bilami uh, uh, so showed 30% uh, of battery drain due to loss of sleeping time and data uh, retransmission and 100% packet loss due to misalignment of sleep cycles. So the other one is a kind of a broadcast attack. This is something like sending unauthenticated, uh, uh, unauthenticated uh, requests uh, to the sensor nodes. Uh, so this will be uh, discarded uh, with the uh, with the authentication failure, but uh, anyway, the devices have to wait uh, uh, awake uh, to receive these messages. Uh, pollution attack is something like uh, where we intentionally send uh, uh, traffic uh, to collide with the actual traffic. Uh, so the sensors has to retransmit uh, so th those data. So then they will have to uh, spend much more energy than normal and wormhole attack is something uh, again where we uh, expose the network uh, uh, messages so the uh, senders have to uh, retransmit their messages so on this retransmission they waste their uh, energy that they have so the solutions are uh, design a solid map layer protocol uh, and the other one is to design an anomaly based intrusion detection system to identify uh, uh, battery exhaustion attacks. So in this work, what we have done is uh, we have developed a uh, data, uh, data set. Uh, we, we, we discussed about uh, strategies to develop a data, data set. Uh, so anyone uh, can use these strategies to develop their own data set to uh, propose their uh, anomaly-based intrusion detection systems. So, uh, so, so the solid, solid MAC layer protocol, this requires input hardware on these tiny smart objects, uh, which is a bit harder. Uh, for the anomaly-based intrusion detection system, uh, we don't find any uh, proper data set uh, 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 in our um, very popular data sets uh, relating to the power details. Uh, of I, uh, I, uh, IoT uh, networks. So, uh, so in this work, we are uh, talking about three strategies basically. Uh, so, anyone can use these strategies and uh, uh, develop their own data set to uh, train and evaluate such a, an intelligent system. Uh, so, in this paper, we are presenting three strategies to simulate power depletion attacks. So, anyone can uh, use these strategies and develop their own data set to build the intelligent intrusion detection systems. So these three strategies we use is uh, a UDP flood attack, uh, and a wormhole attack, and an externally generated legitimate request attack, which is similar to the uh, barrage attack we discussed just now. Uh, as the tools used, uh, we have used the uh, Kucha simulator and the uh, power press application uh, with the Kucha simulator. So, uh, the power trace application produces uh, some important readings on uh, the sensor uh, power readings uh, like uh, accumulated CPU con uh, consumption, accumulated low power mode energy consumption, accumulated transmission energy consumption, accumulated listening, listening energy consumption, accumulated idle uh, transmission energy consumption, accumulated uh, listening energy, uh, idle listening uh, energy consumption, and also uh, for the specific duty cycle as well. Uh, so the UDP flood attack here, what we have done is something like uh, uh, we sent uh, it's something like a broadcast uh, uh, attack. Uh, so here we uh, uh, sent uh, some uh, uh, unauthenticated uh, requests very frequently uh, than the normal behavior of the network. So the victim devices uh, uh, is likely to uh, ex. Uh, spend much more energy than uh, the other devices. So as here, uh, the Sky 4 node uh, has spent much more energy than the uh, rest of the uh, uh, nodes. So, and uh, this Sky 1 is a kind of a, a server node that we have used here. So it's 100% uh, it's online uh, by the time, uh, but the other devices, something like uh, appliance nodes, so where they uh, go to sleep when they are in idle. So, uh, uh, so this kind of, uh, the, the victim node is, uh, uh, is is given. Uh, it has spent uh, much time, much power 
than the other uh, nodes. And we have uh, we have run these uh, simulations for one uh, hour of time, and this. Uh, uh, this data is collected with the power tracker uh, application in the culture simulator and uh, it's uh, in wormhole, wormhole attack is something like uh, uh, what we have done is something like uh, there is a link layer acknowledgement is being uh, transferred from the sender uh, and the receiver uh, so in order to uh, uh, terminate the communication. So, uh, so we what we have done is uh, we uh, edited the uh, mode in order to not to transfer these acknowledgement uh, messages so the, uh, the so uh, so the sending devices uh, is simply unable to uh, detect the uh, uh, the receiver has received the uh, data so it will keep sending 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 data uh, throughout the, the uh, uh, the entire uh, lifetime uh, of the listening phase so it will uh, uh, end up in uh, transmitting much more uh, wasting much more energy so sky uh, three and four you can see um, the victim devices of this uh, simulation has uh, slightly uh, much uh, uh, slightly uh, more energy consumption than the other devices in the same uh, network um, in the externally generated uh, legitimate request attack it's something like uh, where we use the uh, separate python script uh, uh to simulate this uh, so uh, one is given with uh, uh, uh given with the uh, request uh, less frequently than the other uh, device so one uh, device uh, is a three uh, uh, sorry is a two is given uh, uh, much more request than uh, is a uh, three uh, so here uh, is a two is was the uh, victim node. So uh, we configured this to uh, get a um, uh, legitimate request from the same uh, Python script that we ran uh, much frequently than the Z13. So uh, Z12 uh, has consumed much more power than the other uh, other, uh, uh, other node. So, and here again, uh, we were not able to uh, simulate this for a large amount of uh, nodes because of the limitation of the laptop computer that this uh, simulation ran on. Uh, so, uh, that was a problem uh, within this uh, uh, particular simulation. Uh, um, uh, but we can avoid that with uh, a high, uh, high spec computers for this uh, simulation. Uh, conclusion, uh, we successfully showed that the following strategies can be used to effectively replace the power, uh, power on sensor networks. Uh, first one, you need to attack, uh, the wormhole attack then, and then the, then the uh, externally generated legitimate request attack, which, which is similar to a barrage attack. Uh, as future work, uh, we are planning to develop a pro proper data set with these strategies and uh, uh, so with, uh, with a proper balance between the classes uh because of the uh, hardware limitations that we had so far uh, we were not able to uh, produce a, a solid data set uh, with uh, with class in uh, without uh, by avoiding class imbalances so and use this uh, use that data set to develop machine learning models to detect denials of sleep attacks against uh, the sense networks so these are future with us over the zoom yeah so any questions from the audience So, uh, Ishara, this is uh, the work presented in this uh, presentation was, uh, I mean, the data set was created on a uh, simulated platform, right? Yes. So, uh, how would it be different from the real world attempt or such attacks on uh, IoT infrastructure? What, what sort of uh, differences we would experience if it happens on a, a real, real world attack? Yeah, uh, just give me a second. Uh, what sort of differences will be there? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, I was not uh, spec uh, specifying any kind of uh, um, 
domain for this kind of a simulation yet uh, because uh, it was something like uh, over generalized uh, simulation so if we like uh, so uh, this denial of sleep attack is not a kind of a problem for all of the IT, IoT uh, kind of solutions because something like uh, we are uh, uh, we, we do have this smart which is that uh, these variable uh, earbuds or something like that uh, so they can be uh, recharged very frequently or we can uh, uh, change the batteries uh, when we do have these dead batteries but uh, there are some so, uh, situations where we are unable to check, uh, do this uh, maintenance very frequently uh, some something like a uh, smart grid kind of applications so uh, uh, so in this kind of applications so uh, they might need to run this uh, solution for a long time of period uh, maybe years sometimes so uh, these uh, uh, these uh, application uh, performs in a different ways something like some uh, some sensors may be uh, working for like uh, a uh, couple of times uh, during the day, maybe at midnight, and um, uh, maybe uh, one uh, listening phase in the midnight and one uh, listening phase in the uh, daytime. Uh, so, like uh, in such a case, uh, it might be significantly different. But I was uh, just uh, uh, performing some uh, experiments uh, whether uh, we can uh, do this in order to create a proper data set. Uh, that would that would be helpful to develop uh, an anomaly based intrusion detection system. That was my motivation, actually. Certificates for the all the presenters who participated physically, and for the online presenters, we will uh, uh, pass these certificates to you later. So I would like to hand over the session to Sanduni to start this. Uh, certificate. Distribution. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that was indeed an interesting set of presentations. So I take this moment to thank all of the presenters. Uh, and now I kindly invite Dr. Kasim Gunamardana, the session chairperson, to award the certificates to the presenters. Uh, to collect the certificates of appreciation, I invite the following researchers. Uh, first, uh, G.Y. Veera Singh, the author of the paper titled Modeling and Prediction of Pain-Related Neural Firings Using Deep Learning. And next, uh, Dr. Asanka Sayakara, the author of the paper titled Enhancing Source Camera Identification Through Higher Order Wavelet Statistics. Warmly invite Dr. Chamath Kapitya Gamma, the senior lecturer at UCSC, to present the token of appreciation to our session chair, Dr. Kasim Gunwardhan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chamat, for your cooperation in presenting the token. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kasim Gunwardhan, for smoothly handling the session. Uh, with that, we close the sessions lined up for today. We'll be having a very important series of events tomorrow as well. So with the hope of seeing you tomorrow, we we'll conclude for today. And I'd like to remi remind you that tea is served for you on the rooftop. Thank you for your participation, ladies and gentlemen, and have a very pleasant evening. Recording stopped. <laughs>